get a little backbone. That's what we'll do. That's us. We the people. Backbone campaign. No more spineless. It's good to see you. It really is. How's there syruping going out there? We're uh, everything's butted out, so we've stopped tapping. You quit? Um, we quit for the spring. Yeah. How was it but, this uh, spring, though? Though it was pretty good. It was a pretty good run. Uh, but now the uh, you know the wood frogs have been sounding for the last four or five days, and that means the peepers are about two or three days out. So. Spring is definitely coming, although it's been chilly up here. I know we had a streak of cold too, but that's what they say when the frogs start. You can hear the frogs, and also when they say when that, then you start getting the moths. You know, yep. sometimes the moths come a little bit, but that's what they say is when it, the sap is done. Huh? That's it. The mm -hmm. frog run. They call the last day of uh, up here. They call the last day of tapping the frog run. The frog run. But it was a good year for for Vermont. Yeah, we did pretty well. Good. You know, we're still tapping. We're still going. That's nice. Good for you. Mm -hmm. I got, um, you know, when you, everybody is, uh, well, you know, it's a little old school. It's like the old days when everybody used to go to the sugar bush together and the kids weren't in school, you know? And so we're all in the sugar bush together, me and all the grandkids. It's like super fun. It's really good. It's how it should be. Oh, I see. Hi, Bill. Uh, welcome, Winona and Bill. It's a huge uh, pleasure and honor to, that you uh, responded uh, affirmatively to have this conversation. You know, uh, you get a lot of requests and, you know, you're admired by a lot of people and there's a lot of good people on this call today. I just want you to know that, that um, got a couple hundred, um, folks are RSVP'd and there's going to be a lot of people listening and afterwards I'm sure we're uh, live streaming right now so um, don't say anything your mother wouldn't approve of but uh, uh, I do I uh, feel like this is an important moment and uh, we're honored to have you here like I said we have uh, we've invited a, a number of allies to be able to chime in and share perspectives from the different sectors they work in so I want to just start us off here and uh, welcome to everybody. This is a, a strategic conversation with Winona LaDuke and Bill McKibben at this pivotal moment uh, in the COVID-19 climate and hopefully not going back to the old normal. Uh, they we're using the theme grounded my name is Bill Moyer. I'm co-founder of Backbone Campaign, co-author of Solutionary Rail. Today, the Backbone and Solutionary Rail teams will be assisting with Q&A. We've also invited a number of allies to briefly share perspectives from their vantage points as change agents working in various sectors from labor to environmental and climate justice, railroad labor, tribes, and more. Our featured guests, Winona LaDuke and Bill McKibben, really require no introduction. Uh, they are internationally known as leaders in climate justice, indigenous tribal rights and justice, uh, sovereignty. They are passionate solutionaries promoting a transition to a just transition to uh, a decarbonized and dignified future sustainable society. Localization of economies, democracy and resilience requires that we be that we all be grounded, that we reconnect, reconnect to place, the planet and each other. In the old normal, it was difficult to imagine stopping things like air travel. Today, it's easy to imagine that. The climate, planet and creatures need the new normal to look dramatically different from the old normal. And now in this pause, in this moment of awe, we have an opportunity. 
I always come back to the Diane de Prima stanza. Uh, it says, the only war that matters is the war against the imagination. She repeats it three times. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. The only war that matters is the war against the imagination. All other wars are subsumed in it. This seems like an opening moment for our imaginations to imagine the world we want to live in. Keeping fossil fuels in the ground very likely requires keeping airplanes on the ground. So we wanna ask a bunch of questions today. What can activists and change agents do to illuminate and animate the imaginations of the population and communities and support bold climate actions to keep airplanes grounded? We wanna ask what can solutionaries do to build the vision for an infrastructure of decarbonization that provides access and res promotes resilient local economies that serve everyone. COVID-19 is a terrible disease, but let's not squander this opportunity to slow down, decommodify, decolonize, retake our time and our lives, re-indigenize to protect the places we love. So with that, I'd like to invite Winona to start and share some of your reflections about this moment. And then uh, Bill, I invite you to do the same. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring in some of our, our allies to, uh, to share sh a brief statement about what, what things look like from their perspective. And then we'll do our best to facilitate a strategic conversation about how we uh, take joint action together. Thank you. Winona. Um, can you hear me? Cool. Happy New Year. This is the Ojibwe New Year. Cool. When, the, when the trees start to, uh, you know, our maple syruping time is actually considered the new year. And so this is a really good way to start the new year for Mother Earth. You know, everybody here knows that Mother Earth is getting a breath. <laughs> you know, that they can see uh, the sun in China. And most of us can actually, I mean, I, I'm blessed like, you know, Bill as well, but I live in a very rural area, but it's beautiful. And, uh, you know, it, it is this moment where you, where, you know, we have this opportunity to look at where we are and to make good decisions on what is ahead of us. And, you know, in the midst of this, you know, I mean, I've described this as, as when the bat killed the black snake. Um, you know, we have all these fabulous tales of Ojibwe people, you know, and, when, and one of our tales is this, is, you know, we have many stories about our animals and epic things they have done when nobody thought they were important, those animals. You know, and I was like, you know, this isn't the Chinese flu, this is the, the bat. <laughs> the bat that's, trans, that's killing the black snake, the bat that's transforming things. And so I just want to acknowledge our Mother Earth you know, and acknowledge uh, that we're going to do our best to keep, to make things better. And we appreciate this opportunity to do so. And, and I say, you know, that with full acknowledgement and sorrow for the hardship that is caused for a lot of human beings, you know, and um, I want to, I want to say that. Right. And, and I also want to say we're a real anthropocentric bunch mm. and we spend all our time figuring about, you know, what we need to do for humans and, and, it turns out that that probably isn't the best thing. We need to take a much more holistic view. And this is our, our, our check, you know, and in the world that I live, you know, which is this beautiful world in the North country where you could live here and, and you don't really need to go anywhere. It's good to have some trade agreements, you know, to get some goodies from other places, but we're good, you know, we're good. Um, you know, our, our, biggest, our biggest battles are and right now with the fossil fuel industry and, and I don't know if you want to say misery loves company, but if I was feeling bad, those guys are feeling worse. <laughs> and mm -hmm. my pipeline companies are like falling apart at the seams. And I would cry for them, but I cannot cry because they, they, are, they are so egregious in their behavior and their greed has now got them into this position where they are collapsing unto themselves and pipeline companies themselves are you know, saying don't refine any more oil and the tech mine never opened, the Constitution pipeline got canceled and the price of oil, you know, it's cheaper to buy 
a barrel of Canadian oil, then a barrel of monkeys, the game <laughs> in Canada. So I'm like, that was a really bad idea, Canada. You should have had a, a diverse economic plan, not totally based on the tar sands. So quit doing that, get a better plan. And you know, what is clear is this, this is this moment to make a better plan. And so um, I'm really clear that we need to articulate the plan because uh, there's not leadership coming from someplace else. So that's the, just like the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Rona. Uh, Bill, back to you. Well, first of all, thanks for this. And what fun to get to be uh, with Winona, who we've known each other a very long time. And, and here we are on, uh, you know, uh, opposite ends of the northern tier of the continent, happily making maple syrup in the middle of all of this. It's worth noting that the price of maple syrup has not gone down to $3 a barrel. Uh, you can still get a pretty good price if you have any to spare. Um, look, this is a, one of these strange moments in human history. And to me, there's three or four really key insights to take away from it and that we should be repeating over and over and over again. First one is that um, reality is real. Uh, you know, that you actually, that, that we, I've spent 30 years trying to convince people that physics and chemistry are real and that you can't spin or argue or negotiate or compromise with the CO2 molecule. And now we're learning that biology is very real and you can't, it doesn't matter you know, what our president yells from his lectern, the COVID microbe does what it does. And we have to respect its limits. If it's telling us to stand six feet apart, then we got to stand six feet apart. That's a really important basic thing for a world that now spends most of its time staring into screens to realize. Second thing, sort of corollary to it, we've really got to understand how fatal delay is in doing things. You know, we're all becoming epidemiologists now and, and understanding how all this works. The US and South Korea get their first case of coronavirus the same day. The South Koreans go to work. They tell people they can't be in big gatherings, uh, so on and so forth. Um, you know, they take a hit, it's, it's a little painful and disruptive, and now they're kind of looking at the thing through the rearview mirror. As opposed to us, it's crashing through the front windshield because we didn't take any action. It seemed too hard, so we just put it, you know, it's going to be a miracle, the cases are going to go to zero, warm weather will wipe it out, we'll all be fine by Easter, on and on and on and on. And, and, and so now we're going to have we have to do hugely disruptive things, locking down half the country, and we're still going to have, you know, mountains of bodies uh, on the other side. It's a fairly perfect analog for the climate crisis. If people had done what scientists warned them about 30 years ago, we had mildly disruptive things that would have put us on a very different course by now. Since we didn't do it, since instead we just stood on the accelerator, now we've got to do big disruptive things and we're still going to have lots of pain and trauma as a result. But at least we're finally beginning to understand how important speed is. Third thing is, <clears throat> that seems obvious to me, is that this is the moment when the kind of 40 years that began with Ronald Reagan kind of insisting that markets solve all problems this is the moment when that particular emperor's uh, nakedness is is revealed to all. I mean, Reagan said the nine scariest words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Those are not, the, it turns out the scariest words in the English language are, we've run out of ventilators, or, you know, the hillside behind your house is caught on fire, or, you know, there's a whole list of things that can only be addressed if we're able to do things together. So now is the time to kind of recover that idea. Um, those things seem crucial to me. And with those kind of principles in mind, right now is the time to go after, as Winona said, this industry with everything we've got. Uh, it may not be very sporting, but these guys are down, and so let's kick them as hard as we possibly can. 
if I had any, uh, I, I was surprised to find the reserves of anger at this point I still had left in me when it turned out that they were, um, that they're going to start trying to build Keystone right now, that they're going to be flying in workers from around the country into rural areas with bad healthcare systems next to reservations where, I mean, where, his, you know, where people live who historically have lost 90% of their populations to pandemics. The, the willingness to do that is encapsulates for me just every single bit of the, the, the I don't even want the right word. I mean, I guess evil is not really too strong a word almost of the fossil fuel industry at this point. And the idea that we've labeled people building oil pipelines essential workers right now, even as the other arms of the government are somehow, as Winona says, trying to figure out how to keep people from producing oil, how to keep the Russians and the Saudis and everybody from, I mean, we've got more oil than we know what to do with. How can it possibly be an essential task to build one more pipeline for, for oil? So that's a perfect example of a place to go to work hard. Uh, uh, um, um, the thing we can't do, shouldn't do, um, must not do, is just set up the pins in the bowling alley one more time, you know? Um, um, that's what, do you, what mean by that? you know. Well, I mean, just like put everything back the way it was yeah. and, no, you know, get back to normal or, or whatever. I mean, what a waste that would be because we're facing an even larger crisis uh, that sort of, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's worth remembering that this, though it seems impossibly long ago now, that it wasn't but eight or 10 weeks ago that we were all watching transfixed as the continent of Australia basically burned to the ground, you know? Right. Um, 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 so, so getting real about, about reality and where we are right now is, I mean, we've lived under an enchantment for a long time. Um, you know, uh, 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 this enchantment has been all about economic growth and expansion all the time, so on and so forth. Well, this is the moment when we need to wake up uh, uh, from that enchantment and understand that there's a different world that we need to build. And, and as Winona points out, it can be a perfectly beautiful world. It's just going to be a world instead of racehorses designed to run as fast as possible, it's going to be a world of draft horses designed to be hardy and resilient and, 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 and you know, stable. Right. Those are the premiums now. You, you need ponies. You, you can't just have, you got to have diversity. You got to have some ponies. Okay. You got to have some riding horses too. Okay. I'm with you. So just, I'm with you. Yeah, I just want to, having a little more experience with horses. A, a donkey or two wouldn't hurt either. A donkey? Well, they're kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, but how about Bill? You, you know, Bill, you did the forward to Solutionary Rail, and Winona, you've been a big champion of Solutionary Rail. I mean, as we see that the international trade is taking it uh, in the, you know, in the gut right now, which is a, a blessing for uh, the anti-globalization movement. It's an opportunity for localization. Um, for, uh, car uh, loads for freight is is suffering they're in a crisis you know isn't this also an important time that we set up besides having diversity with donkeys and and horses and such let's uh, let's also have some access to a, a a vibrant rail system that doesn't need to have you don't have to be a community that has to have create 50 cars to join into a unit train you can actually access the car because it used to stop there actually your town was created around the railroad so um in terms of this infrastructure moment uh might each of you speak to uh to that question yeah i mean i i'm where i live in northern minnesota i had this moment about a couple of months ago i was driving to duluth no, I was driving to Bemidji and um, I crossed the Enbridge pipelines and I checked it to make sure that it was everything was good because someone needs to make sure that there's no leaks on the pipelines, right? And, and when I go over there and, and check it, 
I, I pull over because there's a sign that coming towards me, there's this like wide load. And so I'm like, I wonder what that is. And so I pull over to the side, but I kind of knew. And you know what it was? It was wind turbine parts. Nice. And those wind turbine parts were coming into the port of Duluth because that's the furthest inland port. And they were coming in from Europe where most wind turbine parts are. And they were on this rural road in Northern Minnesota crossing the pipeline. And I was oh. like, it's an intersection of the two economies, right? And you know, so the solutions are quite apparent. You need to rebuild and industrialize. You need to intentionally reindustrialize. Right. Let's call it that. Right. You know, I mean, we make, you know, I mean, nobody needs the lecture on why everything shouldn't be made in China. Right. You know, I mean, every mechanical piece of equipment is made there, you know? And, and so I just feel like that's one opportunity is appropriate reindustrialization. Right. right. The transportation, the, you know, certainly the backbone campaigns work, you know, the work of, of relocalization in food is absolutely clear. I mean, the slow food movement or the indigenous slow food movement or whatever, you know, we've been doing this for forever. That maple syrup is a slow food, right? <laughs> that's the stuff, you know, this is the stuff that life is made of, you know. It's and literally that, that, slow when you. When it's you really pour. slow. It's just right. Drip. Drip. Okay. Yeah. And, and trains, uh, trains so for sure, man. Trains yeah, tra for sure. I mean, we were joking about horses, but the iron horse you yeah, know, the has trains. its day again. Yeah. Uh, and and thank you for all that work you've been doing around that. Yeah, I I love I love that stuff on Solutionary Rail. I mean, you guys are brilliant. It's a brilliant idea. And you know, where I live, you know, you can catch a train to Minneapolis if you want to get up at 3 a.m and you wanna wait for a while, make sure it's gonna show up, you know, and, and cross your fingers. It'll be there at some point, but you know, I'd like, a, I'd like a train that would arrive at a coherent time, you know? I think there's a lot of people that would like a train system that works and isn't an embarrassment to, you know, was it, what's a uh, consular Bulgaria. say, embarrassment to Bulgaria, right? I think like, so. You know, it's like, it's ridiculous, you know? So those opportunities, of course, I am the hemp farmer, Cause I'm, this is like some of my, I've been twining hemp here while I've been talking to you. You know, this is my last, this is uh, two years ago's crop. And then I have last year's crop, which is some Canadian, uh, some, some Kentucky hemp. But you know, the point is, is that one, Minnesota had 11 hemp, hemp mills. Minnesota had 11 hemp mills. Wow. And the word canvas comes from cannabis. I mean, so most of the materials economy could be made from something like hemp. You know, but part of the point is that you don't want the same materials economy. You don't want a materials economy that's so wasteful. What you want is a materials economy that makes sense for people, you know, so the potential is, is, is clear. You know, you want to do things like innovative things like wash your, wash your glass bottles, you know, for all your breweries at one place, you know, yeah. I mean, the Bayern Brewery used to do it over in Missoula. You know, but that's what you need is like, you need that kind of a vision and you need a re, in, re appropriate re industrialization that makes some sense. And then I just want to say one more thing for what Bill was talking about. I mean, there's a lot to be said on this and everybody else, the other pa people who are going to contribute, they have things to say too. You know, and of course, what we're talking about is also that the next economy must have justice in it. Like mm -hmm. we get a seat at the table, you know, and, and, and as a matter of fact, we want to help set the table and we want to serve the food. But we want to, you know, we want to, because we don't like the food on the last table, you know, but um, my, my, you know, my, my other thought is, is just to respond to Bill. So they announced the, uh, the, the KXL is going to go ahead in South Dakota, but South Dakota and North Dakota have this competition. It's ongoing between who can be the stupidest state in terms of regulation. All Native people know that. And so we just sit there and kind of watch and, you know, it's kind of like, wow, we really hate those Lakotas. So let's just do something mean to them. That's the way they act out there, you know? So she announces it's good, it's all good. And then what do they have the hot spot for COVID this week? Just moved to South Dakota, 640 cases at a meat processing plant. South Dakota, go South Dakota, just what you needed, right? It's wow. all good, essential workers, 640 cases at the Smithfield meat packing camp. Sadly, most of those are immigrant workers, you know? So they're, they're toughing it out there, but you know, my point is, is that at the court, the court also threw out the permits for KXL, um, you know, again. And so my point is, it's really hard to build a pipeline. I just want to bring that point one more time up to you guys. Just quit building it. 
Just quit building them. You got enough lines. You know, time to phase them out. Time to quit with your latest, biggest gig, you know, of, of whatever that male patriarchy stuff is. And just, you know, chill out. It's hard to build a pipeline. You're never going to get them through. And right now you don't even have the oil to fill them. So anyway, but Bill, like a, the other bright side about South Dakota is the uh, court said it's not going to happen for, for, you know, so anyway. Right on. So, uh, so you know, it, it's our perspective that, you know, is, is we want creative protests, of course. You know, we, we, we want to see, you know, great symbolic action. But in reality, right now, it feels like the time is now for less symbol, symbolism and more uh, kicking ass and um, stopping commerce. Like we have the opportunity right now to do have greater impact on the supply chain than ever. We have greater impact. We can have greater impact on any number of things. In, um, and we can force a recovery that works for everybody, not this bullshit we just saw with like the, the bailing out the, the millionaires and billionaires. So um, I know that was just, that was, we can leverage that, that energy and that anger. So I'm going to invite um, Andrea Vidalry, one of our allies uh, from um, San Bernardino County, works on uh, with a community uh, impacted by warehouses and all these freaking diesel trucks that are moving stuff to Amazon warehouses. And Andrea, I'm really hoping that you can uh, give us a bit of a lay of the land from your perspective. Check. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Andrea Vidaure. I'm with an organization called the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. We're out here in the San Bernardino Riverside County um, you know, we, we're the front lines of consumerism and many times the front line of parts of the supply chain. And like many other parts of the nation right now in the world, right, um, our communities have not stopped their operations. Our communities have not stopped all of the movement. Um, and even through a pandemic, right? Even through a pandemic when we need to be shutting down, when we need to be stopping, you know, the spread of this, um, our families are those essential workers. Our families are those putting themselves at risk every single day with this like empty compliment of being called essential when they're really being treated as if they're disposable. And so, and all while we have these industry groups, you know, in the state right now, the biggest industry groups telling our state regulators that they need to relax on regulations, that they don't have enough money to comply um, to um, the regulations that were existing and that we should just stop all of the future ones. So as we're here trying to figure out mutual aid, trying to figure out these systems of sustainability with ourselves, we also have to be looking at what's happening in the background because these people do not stop. They do not stop trying to capitalize off of a pandemic and off of our lives. And so really quickly, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, the crisis has shown us a lot of things that we already knew, this false notion of a social net that the government tries to give us, um, and that we've been also learning that the solutions have always been based here in our communities. And if we leverage everybody's resources together, we can lift up collective suffering. Um, you know, my, our communities are moving 40% of the nation's stuff right? All of that burden onto our communities right here. Um, and, you know, uh, Winona talked about like diversification of the economy. And it's so incredibly important because when you do not diversify the economy and you make it all dependent on a certain amount of people, that is where so much of the injustice happens, right? Because if we, but it's also where all of the power lies, right? And, and we're seeing that, right? Right now, I think it's so important to establish and institutionalize um, the power of the workers that are essential for them to re rename and reconstruct the power dynamics that exist here. And I think we're seeing it. Uh, one quick example that I think was amazing yesterday. So we have the largest concentration of Amazon warehouses here. So Bezos has a new net worth that is um, so much larger. And it's all because of the communities he's in and of the laborers that work for him and make, making that possible. And so um, yesterday, right, uh, tech workers uh, organized a panel with their warehouse coworkers to expose what is actually happening at these warehouses, the, um, the limitations and like the absolute, like the absolute nothing that they are doing to protect the workers. And that cross sector solidarity between the tech workers and those warehouse workers into like re, re, renaming um, the power dynamics, I think was incredibly important. I think it's the first step of all of this, right? Of, of that cross-sector solidarity needed to 
reconstruct the systems we're in to make us more sustainable. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me some time. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Roberto to, uh, to unmute and share his video. Uh, Roberto's uh, with warehouse workers working in, uh, near Chicago. Uh, go ahead, A, from what, what's your perspective there, Roberto? I mean, my, our perspective is, uh, you know, we really need to do some cross-sectional organizing. Uh, originally, we planned for 10 days in the streets between Earth Day and May Day here in Chicagoland uh, to really bring it together for the labor struggle, for the environmental justice struggle, for the immigrant struggle and our community struggles. We're still bringing it together. We're not going to hit the streets as much. Uh, but more than ever, we really need to unite the the fight around economic justice and environmental justice. If we can spend trillions of dollars to bail out the people who are responsible for both oppressing workers and community and the environment, then we can certainly pay for a thing like a Green New Deal and get people back to work and doing good work jobs. Um, you know, so this is what we're gonna be fighting for. We're doing a whole series of events um, that are bringing all these different different communities together. We're fighting for environmental justice in places like Little Village, uh, where um, a big warehouse uh, developer um, destroyed the old Crawford power plant, uh, polluting the entire neighborhood during this whole uh, epidemic. Terrible story. In Joliet, Illinois, they're trying to push through 3,000 acres of more warehousing that no one wants um, during this uh, crisis. This just reflects the corporate greed. You know, as Winona said, you know, they're trying to push through these projects and get their way while this pandemic's happening. We need to make it stop. We need to come together. We need a movement that uplifts all of these different struggles. Environmental justice is our way forward, but we need workers to be a part of that. We need labor unions to be a part of that. And we need to come together because the same people who oppress both the workers and the environment are the rich, the corporations, and we need to hold them accountable and keep organizing. And Earth Day to May Day Chicago. So, right on. Right. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, we should do this as a national event next year. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, Bill and, and Winona, I would like to just bring in a couple more folks just to give a little bit of a spattering from around the country, right? And, uh, and so, Anthony Rogers Wright, uh, if you would turn on your video, um, please come up and give us a brief uh, assessment from your angle. Hi, everyone. It's there great to see you, Winona and Bill. Nice to see uh, you. Bill, I hope my impression of you on Heated like, was up to uh, grew up with Emily Atkin. I, I was wondering what you thought about that. And, and Bill and I are really waiting for COVID-19 to abate so we can talk smack about the Yankees and the Red Sox. We're, we're really, I, I'm waiting for that more so this year than he is probably. But um, I'm the uh, policy coordinator with uh, Climate Justice Alliance. We, of course, are 70 um, frontline organizations from across the nation in Indian country. And what we've noticed, of course, is what I think everyone has seen is that there's an axiomatic nexus between COVID-19, environmental racism, and climate change, both fueled by an extractive economy that treats people, especially Black, Brown, and Indigenous, and their labor as disposable, as we've been saying earlier, from Indian country to the Gulf South to urban Black and Brown centers and across the nation, COVID-19 is a proverbial magnifying glass that's elucidating myriad injustices that have operated unabated for years, decades, and centuries. COVID-19 is the symptom. White supremacy, patriarchy, and colonization are the diseases that are also the root causes of the climate crisis. Um, we also do know, um, as the brother was just saying, that uh, we, we have solutions coming from the front lines, just transition, energy democracy, and, and food sovereignty, which Winona and Bill are big proponents of and, 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 and purveyors of as well, including what, what the amazing work Winona is doing on her own farm. So we say to ourselves, uh, why restart the economy when we can reshape it, um, as Bill was saying earlier? Um, which is why um, uh, CJA and many of our allies were proud to be a part of writing the five principles for a just COVID-19 response, which many organizations got behind, as well as the uh, people's bailout um, as well. 
um, big oil, as Bill knows, is, is in big trouble right now. There's a brother that tweeted the other day, if oil prices keep dropping this sharply, big oil is going to have to start laying off members of Congress. And um, as Winona knows, the uh, black snake is bleeding out, um, uh, the KXL black snake. A judge in Montana just shanked it with, with another litigious blow. So, so it is this great time to come together, and COVID-19 has called on the left to enter into a period of introspection because um, all of the mass mobilizations that Brother Bill's calling for and, we're all, and, and Winona and we're all calling for, uh, we haven't seen it here in the United States as we've seen in Chile and Ecuador, Puerto Rico, Haiti, Hong Kong, and yes, even, even France. And, and maybe that is uh, because, as Adrian Marie Brown teaches us, uh, critical connections have to come before critical mass. So this is a great time where we're all in our homes um, and being more on the screens and being in the streets as we'd like to be, to, to really come together um, because it's, go it's going to take that now. Everything is out on the table and um, this, is, this is what you know, we're inviting everyone to do from CJA and all 70 of our members. So um, right we're looking on. forward, and I'm looking forward to seeing Bill Winona in the street again. It's, it's uh, um, seeing all on the screen is great, but it's so much better when we can do this like we used to, so thanks. We might have to have drive-in marches and blockades, honestly. We might have to, you know, get into our freaking cars, hopefully with our pods, so we're not alone, and drive to the intersection from four directions and blockade the shit. Um, I, there's just no way that we're going to get what we want unless we can stop commerce. And I want to introduce this next uh, friend, respected friend, uh, Michael Foster, who uh, risked a great deal as a valve turner and, uh, and made the, a big sacrifice spending a year in jail for his action. Um, Michael, I'd like to invite you to share your perspective. Sure. Um, so to me, it seems like uh, Boeing is the focal point uh, at this moment that I a monopoly that is our number two government contractor uh, subsidized uh, their stocks in the toilet because they built planes. Uh, the, um, the federal regu regulators were the employees of Boeing. Um, and so those planes were grounded for a year. Their stock was in the toilet and um, and they are too big to fail because they sell weapons around the world. They should be nationalized to protect jobs and workers and health, and nobody should go without pay or a good union job at Boeing. And they should be using their expertise to build windmills and electric trains and electric buses, mass, electric mass transit, and anything, anything. They can build and dominate any industry they choose. If they enter into a product line, they are going to be the biggest manufacturer of that product. Uh, but at this moment, we're not talking about nationalizing Boeing. We're talking about eliminating the Postal Service. So I think we're failing as a movement um, to uh, maybe, maybe do the drive-by protests like Bill's talking about. I don't know. Um, so that, that's kind of the canary in the coal mine for me is Boeing. And the other thing I want to say is about Climate Assembly, uh, www.climateassembly.us. We are going to uh, start the Climate Assembly here in Washington State online this summer, like the ones in the UK and France. And we are going to have recommendations for candidates by September 1 on a dozen climate policies that have 80% or more public support. This is the opposite of spending millions on a single campaign for a policy on a price on carbon. This is an entire climate plan and guidance for any candidate. And we're gonna tell, we're gonna ask the candidates, will you support the will of the people on climate uh, come the elections? All right. So that's that's what's happening right now. We're halfway there. We just need a half million dollars, uh, but we have government buy-in here in Washington State, so it's going to happen. And then hopefully we'll push it out to other states and possibly a national climate assembly on Zoom this summer.
Okay, cool. Thank you, Michael. And thanks for all the sacrifice you've made uh, for on the climate issue and everything else. So um, I would like to give uh, Winona and Bill an opportunity to respond to some of those folks they just heard from. And then we're gonna, we've got some questions lined up. They're gonna be kind of uh, uh, summarized and brought in by folks in on our team who've been watching online um, and uh, in the chat, in the Q and A. So Winona, um, any responses from the, those uh, eight change agents you've heard? Really nice to hear, you know, and, and I, the, the sister from the Amazon zone, you know, I, 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 I cannot even imagine, you know, I drive out, I, I've driven out by those places before and I'm like, that is like a lot of warehouses, you know? And, um, you know, I do think it is, it's every, thank you all for your what your what everybody is saying and and michael thank you for coming out and locking down on our pipelines out here we just really appreciated that as a valve turner but you know that's the fact is, is that a lot of the infrastructure is in place you know you got to retool infrastructure so it makes sense it's not like we got to rebuild the infrastructure of this country i mean some of it has to be rebuilt like nix the 5g thing but aside from that you know, a lot of a lot of the pieces are there. They just need to be transformed into something that makes sense, and that workers and people of color, you know, have have a a, a good feeling about. Because that's really, you know, I've been thinking about um, being of a good mind, being of a good mind, and that's what the Iroquois say or the Six Nations. They talk about coming together with a good mind. And, and that is what we need is like the solutions are there and the only solutions that work are, are, work, are things, solutions that come from a good mind. Right. And so every piece of this has an answer and we need to really, you know, I do believe and know that this is our time. You know, the creator put us here now and crazy things are happening in the world around us. Take your, take your power back people and make the change, you know? And, and this summer is gonna be the summer of, they used to call them victory gardens, but we call them resilience gardens. Nice. You know, that's what we're gonna do. And every little community should have that, you know? But, but start taking back our power sector by sector, but definitely this is the year of the 2020 election. So, you know, use our power by any means necessary to make that transformation that we need, you know? And um, I was I was glad to see my my friend Anthony and just you know really really grateful to all of you for your work. Thank you, thank you, Renata. Amen to that. Amen to that. It's so good to see people that you <clears throat> that I know and people that I don't know yet, and just be reminded what a big broad diverse movement that we've got. Let's see those. Th I think there's some good questions to be asked, and mm -hmm. I see them. To hear them. Yeah. yeah. Great. Hey, Ronnie, do you want to, how's that going? You want to, you have anything specific you want to relay from the? Yeah, I've got a, a really good question here. We haven't talked that much about um, the really hard science behind it, but their bunny hatcher on Dashon pointed out that climate change is making areas uninhabitable and that really forces a lot more diseases like Ebola and COVID and it's really connected, um, obviously. But so what can we do in the meantime? Because like, we, are we going to stop things fast enough before another pandemic? Or are we going to see another pandemic just because it's already too late? All right, cool. Thank you. Well, this is the third or fourth of these that we've seen so far this century. Um, and clearly this is happening uh, at an increased scale. That said, it's really important to focus on this health emergency because it's a real health emergency. But it's also important to remember that there are a lot of other health emergencies underway. I mean, we're worried about everybody's lungs right now, right? Like <clears throat> with COVID. But worth remembering that, you know, of the 5 million children in New Delhi, two and a half million have irreversible lung damage just from breathing the air. So there are a ton of good reasons to be uh, taking um, the environment in all its forms a lot more seriously than we've been doing and human health is high on the list. And if you were gonna make a list of priorities, uh, dealing with pollution would be right up there. There are no silver linings to a pandemic, but it's uh, ironic and interesting 
that there are a lot of places on the planet right now where people are getting literally the first lungfuls of clean air they've ever breathed in their lives. Mm. Right. All right, yeah, Phil, I mean, I, mm, go ahead. Even the U, that's what the UN climate chief, chief says, Inger Anderson, right? That's what she said. She said, you know, well, first she said, Nova pointed out that like 8 million people is a figure, I think she used, 8 million people die a year from lung, you know, respiratory is associated with pollution. You know, we just don't count those people because they're poor people of color in third world countries. You know, but that's the, the fact is that people are dying from the choices that were made by big corporations and from the consumerism of the United States. You know, and then, but then the second part, you know, but I looked at Bunny's question is, is that, you know, we are gonna see more diseases. That's just the reality of the situation. You know, we're now like hanging out, you know, I got a, a brown recluse spider that showed up, like two of my friends got bit by a brown recluse. They aren't supposed to be here. You know, climate change moved brown recluse into Northern Minnesota, that's crazy. But that's the reality that we have created of climate change where these creatures are moving in. And so, you know, what you do for now is you keep fighting the bad guys, you, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to protect the brown recluse, don't get me wrong on this, but you know, my point is, is that you create corridors and, sec and you protect the biodiversity. I mean, indigenous people are 5% of the world's population and we represent 75% of the world's biodiversity. So, you know, it's not like we're like a special interest group for crying out loud. We are the Amazon, we are the Arctic, and where we live in Northern Minnesota, I call this where the wild things are because almost all of the biodiversity in Minnesota is here, you know, and that's why we don't want a pipeline. It's like, this is where the wild things are. And so you protect those things, you work with indigenous people, you expect that there's gonna be another pandemic and then you, you know, then you get a little bit smarter, you know, a little bit smarter. Um, you know, and that's, this is our, I, I assume, I think of this as kind of like a test run, you know, because I don't think things are going to get a lot better. You know, we're going to make some changes, but there's still going to be a lot of stuff that's, you know, that's going to be challenging. So take those challenges on and prepare, you know, prepare your communities and begin, begin that, you know, we just need to begin that transition. Well, one question is just how do we do this kind of work in a time when we're all supposed to be distancing from each other? Right. And that's a really good question. I mean, what makes this uh, crisis so different from other ones is that, you know, normally in a disaster, the human instinct is to get together and help. Uh, and Rebecca Solnit wrote that wonderful book, Paradise Built in Hell, a couple of years ago, about how that's precisely what happens over and over and over again. Whenever there's a storm or a fire or whatever, people long before the government gets there, people get there. That's, you know, the Cajun Navy rescuing people off the roofs of buildings in Katrina. And in this weird case, we're not allowed to do that. You know, the way that we help is by staying apart, which is a very strange moment. I, I am glad that we have these tools that allow us to try and overcome some of that. It's by far not perfect. I mean, Next Thursday, we were scheduled to have civil disobedience in the lobbies of probably 2,000 Chase Bank branches around the country because they're the biggest funder of the fossil fuel. We can't do that now, um, um, but there's going to be good, interesting, powerful online three-day Earth Day Live thing that Climate Strike US, all the kids are putting together that starts on Wednesday. So if you go to Earth Day Live, Google that, you'll get some sense. Um, um, I think one thing is when we get out of detention, finally, uh, we're going to be reminded how much we like uh, being with each other. And maybe it'll really allow us to be a little, I mean, look, Americans have been socially distancing themselves for decades, hiding behind an ever larger number of screens. Maybe some of our natural gregariousness will uh, reassert itself in the wake of all this. I think that that's part of what they're afraid of. I, I think that's um, um, from our point of view, like I think some people are afraid, um, you know, some corporations and government are afraid that um, we might enjoy ourselves not going to work every day, <laughs> you know, not being all stressed out. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a super interesting thing. I mean, you know, Trudell used to say the difference between a wage slave and a slave in chains is that the second one knows exactly where he stands. 
the difference mm -hmm. between a wage slave and a, a slave in chains. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, the fact is, is that a corporate economy turns you into a wage slave. And, and this system has turned people into slaves. And we need to deconstruct slavery, you know, in, in, in that, you know, in that realm. And I, you know, I, I think about that because that's also in your mind, like that, you know, you need all this and you got to do this and you got to do this. And so it's, you know, it's taking apart the mythology of what it is to be a healthy economy or what it is to be healthy, you know, because, you know, so like I'm relocalized, you know, we're all quarantined out here on the reservation and you know who we get to quarantine with? You like this. Bill, we get to quarantine with the Amish. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the Amish and the Ojibwe's are hanging out together. And we actually, we're like, all oh, good. You know, we're like, you know, I mean, it's a perfect example of didn't actually need all that stuff, did we? You know? Right. Which, well, that's an aspect of decolonization, isn't it? I mean, isn't that an aspect of taking the moment to decolonize our own imaginations, our own time in order to reinvest in community and localization? Uh, is, uh, Diane Whitner, uh, Diane's another uh, part of the team and she's been watching the Q&A. Diane, what can you reflect from the Q&A? All right, yeah. so Byron Brink wants to know that if Joe Biden is elected, he's talked a little bit about a nationwide high-speed rail system. So Byron's question is, if he's elected, how do we sway public opinion and get people on board with rail? Um, I'd like... I'd love to know actually what we do to get people on high on board with high speed rail and freight uh, electrification and if even if we need to uh, nationalization of the railroads prior to Biden. Like I, I appreciate Byron, but this is not a, a conversation about we're not going to repeat. This is the most important election of your lifetime. When was the last election that you heard that it wasn't the most important election of your lifetime? Let's see because movement follows policy follows culture. So what are we going to do to shift culture to answer By, uh, Byron's question? Check. I'll just, let me just say, I, you know, I, Biden's not, uh, you know, was not my <laughs> candidate for president. But the best thing about him is he does love trains. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's a good uh, wedge for getting other people to start thinking about trains again and yeah. getting them top of mind over and over again. Uh, take what you can get. <laughs> We're not gonna get and you know all, all that we uh, wanted or hoped for out of Joe Biden, but um, you know, he has spent a lot of time uh, uh, sitting in the uh, you know, quiet car uh, uh, headed up and down the Northeast corridor. So uh, that's something. <laughs> All right, uh, Diane, anything else from the, the chat, from the Q&A? Yeah, so Tim Gould has a question about the public sphere. So the question is, how can the public sphere, including public transportation, public processes and decision-making and so forth, be reinvigorated when a time where so many people are distancing and avoiding others? The idea is to not go backwards in terms of areas that have already been neglected like public health and other public institutions. Well, this is what I was saying before. The, the thing that you, the message that has to come out of here is that social, that solidarity and social solidarity is crucial. This has got to be the death knell to the Ayn Rand, libertarian market solve all problems, laissez-faire stuff that we've been living with for 40 years. And that's, you know, led to the staggering and the two things that have spiked on our planet in the last 40 years are the temperature and the level of inequality. And to one degree or another, both of them have their roots in that merciless, uh, you know, world that, that, that we got when we decided that uh, we should just get out of the way and let business do whatever business was going to do. So God, God hopes that this is the, uh, the death knell for that. Amen to that. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everybody in the chat. Um, so there were other questions around uh, the, um, the Green New Deal and, and that sort of thing. There was, I, I know that a lot of folks are working in organizing, um, like in local food security, uh, that piece, um, you know, with the, um, 
with the uh, this in in obscene a bailout of of millionaires and billionaires um perhaps there should be some appetite for um some occupation style uh activities maybe obviously we following safety protocols but to um but what kind of actions do you see as having the most potential to shift culture in this um in the next couple months and right, what what would the be the kind of things you'd like to see in the next month that we could spread throughout our uh, alliances and um and bring to our communities so that uh so that we're setting the stage for a culture shift and not going back to the same old normal nor the idea that market's going to save everybody from everything so i'm working on the new green revolution that's what i call cannabis it's cool. the new green revolution you know, I mean, and in Minnesota, you got to do that because Minnesota brought us all the last green revolution with that Norman Borlaug and all, and that was a bad idea. And so we need to have, make the new green revolution. So that's going to take some time, you know, so you, you made the industry illegal. It's got the most potential for, about anything. I mean, the Department of Transportation contacted me about, like, is there a possibility of using this for roadside erosion? If, they, if we made mats out of it, I was like, yeah, if I could get a damn mill. You know, so my point is, is that rebuilding, researching and trying to figure out the infrastructure is part of what we're gonna be doing now. Now, I don't know if they're asking for the next two months, but I'm saying like, this is the stuff that we need to do. We need to keep moving ahead in creating the next economy because it's, it need to be created. She need to be birthed. And so we need to be, we, we need to be working on that. So I'm working on this, these questions of, of, um, of you know, fiber hemp basically, you know, and, and, and how that is gonna be grown out over the, over the next while so we can have a new green revolution, you know, and make everything that we were making out of, we, you know, plastics not out of that. And then we need to look at, you know, all these ordinances. I mean, a lot of cities are looking at these issues and now would be the time to push them forward. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you guys live in places where they pass ordinances like you can't have plastic bags. I live by Fargo. <laughs> North Dakota, you know, I mean, that's the state that, you know, didn't, doesn't have a lockdown, right? But the point is, is that, is that keep pushing, you know, building the groundswell for the next economy or the, you know, the pieces for the next economy. Now I'm a farmer, so I'm focused on it's spring. There's things you're going to do in spring that you aren't going to do in the fall and winter. In the winter time, you should be thinking about smart stuff, right. you know, because everything else is asleep. But in the spring, you should be planting. And so let's show how beautiful the next economy is. You know, I, you know, you can see our, us at, at honorearth.org, www.honorearth.org. And, you know, that's our work. You know, we are not only, I, you know, I'm working on hemp, but we, we're, we're building solar thermal panels that called Eight Fire Solar. And our solar thermal panels will reduce your heating bills by 20%. Nice. Well, y'all should be buying them now because winter's coming again. And so get them installed, reduce your heating bill by 20%. Nice. You know, do smart stuff. Um, you know, during this, during this, while you ha are coherent, let's put it that way, be coherent and do smart stuff. We're building the whole, you know, we're rebuilding the economy. We're not the only people doing it, but if you go to 8 Fire Solar, or honorearth.org, you can learn about, you know, our work up there. And right here, you know, like I was talking, I was kind of, how, how funny it is. Like I live on this highway, our farm is on a highway and I have a stand. And you know, this summer, I'm gonna be full on local foods. And I know that everybody who decides to go to their lake home this summer will be stopping there because we're gonna have all the local, you know, Amish goat cheese, you know, smoked fish, maple candy. Why wouldn't you stop there? Exactly. Right? So be cool. Be That's cool and get grounded. And and so thank you so much, Winona and Bill. I'd love you to make um some of your final um uh, reflections on this. And uh, and I, I want to thank you both for doing this talk and everybody else on the team and all of our friends and allies who participated. So Bill, um, go ahead. First reflection, uh, I hope we 
with the lockdown enough that I can get to Winona's farm stand. Second reflection, uh, what Anthony said was just right about justice as a, uh, as a kind of underpinning here. Third, I'm really glad that uh, Michael was talking about these climate assemblies. One thing we can do right now is talk and we've got this low carbon Zoom stuff to do, so might as well get good at it. Um, and the fourth thing I would say, if you're looking for immediate actions, you can't go get arrested like Reverend Yearwood and I did at the Chase Bank in January in DC. But if you've got a Chase credit card in your wallet, and you probably do, then you probably also have, because they've put out an awful lot of them, then you probably also have a pair of scissors in the kitchen drawer, and maybe you have a webcam and if you got those three things, then you're well poised to strike a, a, a sharp blow against the biggest bank in the world and the real pillar of global capital. So uh, never give up. On we go. And thanks so much, uh, Bill, everybody else for having us here. Uh, this has been um, um, really, really useful. Well, thank you very much uh, for both of you. Nice I just want to bring you, Bill. One uh, one uh, reflection back from railroad labor guys, an idea that came from somebody at RW is that we do another Occupy, but this time when we're able to, we don't just occupy public spaces, we occupy Amazon warehouses, we occupy Boeing, we occupy places that are going to actually make a material difference uh, um, and uh, shut down commerce. But that was just a, a last bit of radical world work uh, words from our WW, our wobbly friends. All right. Can I just say one thing? I see a couple of questions about this re-indigenizing and you asked that. Yeah, yeah, it's something okay, I feel so look, sensitive this about. This is what I think is, you know, people are not native people, but you know, look, this is your situation is, is we're someplace. Be good to that place and support the indigenous people that are there. Build partnership and build relationship and then things change. But you know, that's, this is this whole question of America, it's so transient that people don't feel like they belong anywhere and they keep moving. And now we know we belong someplace and we're there. So be there, right. you know, be there. Now we got to be there whether we, whether we like it or not. <laughs> That's, right. That's it. Yeah, get Amen. grounded. Amen. Work from where you're planted. You. Grow from where you're planted. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Winona. Have a great day. Folks, please do share this conversation. It'll be up at Backbone Campaign's Facebook page. Really appreciate Bridget and Vanessa for all their support. Diane and Amy and Phil and Ronnie and Danny and all of our teammates and all of our allies. So thank you everybody for coming on. We look forward to seeing you in virtually or actually making beautiful trouble, keeping it in the ground, keeping planes on the ground and keeping grounded in our communities. Thank you all. Over now from Backbone HQ. Nobody can do it for you. You gotta do it for you. Only we the people can carry it through. Get a little backbone. That's what we'll do. That's us. We the people. Backbone campaign. No more spineless.